if you're getting picture, if you see the slides properly. So please give me a brief feedback using the questions and answers box of the GoToWebinar. Okay, thank you for your feedback. So let's start. So a little bit about myself hosting it on today's event. I'm Stalvin, Virtual Send Product Manager. Previously had more than eight years of GA and technical support experience in this company and about 10 years of professional IT experience. And also you may notice that I'm hosting a lot of Stalvin webinars nowadays. So you may see me appearing on other events as well. Now, here is the slide where you can see our social networks for your future reference and our agenda for today. First, we'll go through Microsoft SQL Server clustering and the variety of options you have with SQL Server clusters. We'll then talk about always on the native feature SQL Server offers for high availability and disaster recovery with business continuity. We'll look through the native shared nothing HA capabilities offered by SQL Server. Then we'll see alternative ways of clustering SQL Server, not always on availability groups, but other ones. And we'll see how storage virtualization changes the SQL clustering game. In the end, we'll have a Q&A session, and I'll gladly answer all your questions. Now, so here's a subject of this discussion. The software of choice for multiple businesses across the world. For some companies, it's even the primary business application, which is the cornerstone of all their production environments. All their critical data is stored there. And so we have some funny characteristics of it. So SQL is one of the most eye hungry applications used in production environments. And uh, luckily it has predictable appetite. So we do not get the famous eye blender here. We can still plan for our read and write distribution, we can see if we are getting lots of random IOPS or we get sequential access to our database. So it's a little easier to control and there is no ultimate answer. You only need all flash solution, which you may often hear in the virtualization world. Then since SQL Server is the most important business application. It needs protection from outages. It needs protection from human factor. But uh, Microsoft tells us SQL Server pre prefers to be always on. And always on here is a set of features Microsoft implemented in SQL Server to make sure that users get their business continuity with database software. Now, always on is uh, comprised of multiple features like mock shipping, availability replicas, failover cluster instances, and some more. There's, there was also database mirroring, but now they're trying to move away from it, replacing it by availability replicas. And all these features are targeted at either on-site availability or also disaster recovery solutions. Where let's say you can have synchronous replication between servers on-site. They can be both active. Some of them can be passive, depending on how you configure it. 
and you can also make sure that somewhere across the country, maybe on the west coast, maybe on the east coast, depending on where you are, you'll have a disaster recovery replica. And if something goes wrong in your primary office, you'll be able to get up and running quickly from another location, be it another on-premise location or a cloud-based cloud location. Now, always on is divided into basic features and advanced features. And please know that full support of always on functionality is only available with the SQL Server Enterprise license nowadays. So even if you're using business intelligence license, you still have a little limited always on support. Now, let's do a small poll here. We'll just use the basic questions and answers and we'll just see who of our attendees is using always on availability groups or any other high availability solutions provided by Microsoft for the SQL Server clustering. Okay, excellent. So I would say that uh, so far, based on the responses, at least 30% of our attendees are using certain technologies to get high availability of their SQL server. Mostly it is native functionality. Few people just reply that they use a SAN for SQL Server availability. So as you can see, it's a really demanded feature. It's not a surprise for anyone that Microsoft charges a premium for getting the full set of native high availability features for SQL Server. And that's why we see that the pricing for the Enterprise Edition is at least twice as much as one for Standard Edition. Now, let's dive a little deeper into the availability groups and log shipping as primary tools to do shared nothing business continuity with SQL Server. On the diagram we have on this slide, we've got our primary site with the active SQL Server on the left, and we have synchronous replication to an active secondary SQL Server on the right. This is accomplished using availability groups and availability replicas. So the storage is replicated using native SQL Server functionality. The actual replication is not the entire database but just the log. And then uh, your active is serving your clients. Your active secondary may be serving clients or may be used for backups or may be used for catalog operations. You can also configure the secondary box on site to be passive if you need. And this will be a little easier on the licensing because as far as the licensing guides tell us, the active replicas have to run the enterprise license. The passive replicas can do with just the standard license. And uh, on the disaster recovery side, we can use a standard license and just use log shipping from the primary location to have our DR replica, just in case. Now this is the typical configuration and this is what a lot of customers use, but uh, according to approximations we made, this is a really expensive deployment and no wonder because 
true high availability features are not required by smaller companies as Microsoft may think, but uh, times have changed and small companies all over the world realize they do require high availability, they do require some of the enterprise features, even though they cannot be considered enterprise yet. So for those companies, there is niche in the licensing where you can just use two servers and still get high availability. Like on this diagram here, we see always on failover cluster instances. So we've got a Windows Server failover cluster running two standard SQL Server 2014 licenses, and we have a SAN or a NAS or any other shared storage. It can be a SAS, JBOD, and shared cluster shared volumes configured on top. And we basically use that shared storage resource to feed our database to both active and passive node. Should the active node fail, we can always fail over to the passive node and vice versa as soon as we fix the other node. So the idea is pretty simple, like any other server clustering solution, but there are certain issues associated with it. Even though we already accepted that we use standard licensing and we don't get all those fancy features available with the enterprise or business intelligence licenses. There are some pros, like we get flexible licensing. We are not supposed to go with just per core license as it is with enterprise. We can also try to do a per server license and client access licenses. In case of small companies where you don't have I think more than 30 users, as far as I've read on the web, this appears to be more cost effective compared to per core pricing. Then just using two standard licenses instead of an enterprise license and a standard license for the passive is much more cost effective, sometimes cost effective up to a point of not getting two enterprise licenses but buying a SAN and two standard licenses. And of course, uh, another pro is that we get part of our always-on functionality like FCIs and log shipping, so we can still fulfill our basic high availability demand with this license. The cons for standard license, we need shared storage, we need a third-party solution, and we need a, oftentimes a dedicated storage box for high availability. And for true high availability, but not an inverted pyramid of doom, like it was in the previous slide, we need our storage to be highly available as well. So it's either a dual controller box or two storage boxes replicating between each other. Otherwise, our cluster can fail as soon as something happens to the storage. And IT practice shows that something happens to the storage all the time. Another con of the standard license is that hardware utilization is limited and certain features are unavailable. Like uh, 2014 introduced some in-memory functionality like in-memory OTP or in-memory columns. So these are not available. And also the RAM amount you can use is limited. So this is what we have with the standard licenses. But here we can see what uh, Starwind changes in the game. Now, this is the same cluster we had on the FCI slide. So we just have two hosts. We have their local storage. We have SQL Server 2014 running on each server. There is one active copy and there is one passive copy, not included it on the diagram, just to make it a little clear, so we don't confuse it with storage copies as well. And we also have Starwind, and Starwind does the 
tricky thing of getting away from a SAN, getting away from a dedicated SAN, and also giving you high availability with 100% less hardware. So instead of two dedicated SANs, you just turn your local storage into a SAN and give it back to the local servers. Windows Server failover cluster recognizes it as shared storage, then you convert it into a CSV and put your SQL Server cluster on top. This is still accomplished with just two standard licenses and always on FCI, so there is no need to go with enterprise licensing here. Users who want to get more performance can use PCIe Flash in each server and benefit from it because there is no dedicated storage box and there is no need to deploy dedicated storage fabric. And also there are some additional features I wanted to show on the next slide. Um, the, just a quick connection check, we have two users complaining about audio quality, so I just want to make sure that we're not getting cut off all the time. So just a brief audio check, please. Okay, thanks for the feedback. Uh, for those attendees who are having connection issues, I would recommend to turn off the VoIP and turn on the VoIP in the GoToWebinar control panel. This usually helps. If that does not help, I would recommend to relaunch the webinar control panel or check your internet connection. I know that's obvious, but sometimes the solution is in the simple things. Okay, excellent. So, once again, what does Tarwin Virtual Send change in the SQL clustering game? First of all, if we compare a two-node Tarwin cluster with, let's say, one terabyte of storage running SQL Server cluster using two standard licenses, and we compare this to two enterprise licenses, running on the same hardware using just local storage. We calculated that Starwind deployment price is more than three times effective compared to the native solution price. Of course, you don't get the additional features you get with the enterprise license, but if your idea and your goal is high availability, but not all the reporting stuff and not the additional features, this is a great thing to have this dramatically decreases the total cost of ownership and the capital expense for your entry into that feature set and simplifies your life on the everyday basis because you don't you don't need to make sure the backups went fine you don't need to make sure that someone has access to the service to recover everything from backups if something goes wrong. You simply know that you have a highly available solution with just two servers and should anything happen, the second box will take over and continue and serve your clients. Also, ease of configuration and management is here because uh, most of our attendees already know how to configure SQL Server FCI, and configuring Starwind is not hard at all. We see people configuring our solution from zero to full HA cluster in less than half an hour. You don't need to have any special SAN knowledge. You just install the software on two servers, point the servers to the storage to use in the cluster, point the servers to the 
mix to use to synchronize the data between the servers and then press the connect to the local servers button and you're all set. So there is no send knowledge involved. You don't need to modify the configuration by HBAs and deploy additional servers for storage and stuff like that. You get all of that with just the servers you have and their local storage. Also, using just local storage instead of a dedicated storage box maximizes the performance because you don't really need to go all the way through the proprietary storage link to process your I.O. Instead, you just work with your local storage and Starwind caches the I.O. and replicates it between the servers real time. So this is much faster compared to any dedicated sense. And we see that the market is going this way. More and more companies are developing their hyper converged stacks and storage virtualization will not decrease. It will increase along with the server virtualization all the way till everything is virtualized. So we're going back to the certain type of mainframe era. Then the solution with just two servers and standard licensing. With a standard SEN, you may get features like snapshots, replication, but you don't really get fault tolerance on the disk level and you don't really get fault tolerance on the RAM caching level. So with Starwind, the idea is that you use local resources like RAM and disks and these resources are replicated. So if one server fails, the data cached on the servers in RAM is not lost. It is still available on the second server. So the bullet point here just shows that full tolerance or FT is uh, available with local hardware and you not, don't need to think about achieving this using third-party SANS or any other third-party hardware in your configuration. Just get it with the hardware you already have. And also this is a side effect of using storage virtualization. Normally during backups, the database performance is crippled if you back up the active server. In case when Starwind Virtual Send is used, we aggregate reads from all servers in the cluster. So if we do a backup, that doesn't necessarily mean that we only access the local storage of the active node. We can be aggregating these writes from multiple nodes. In our case, it's two nodes. So the backup performance penalty is at least 50% less compared to a backup launched on an active SQL node. Right. And with that, I would like to thank everyone for looking at our presentation and our little story about alternative architecture of SQL Server 2014 clustering. And we're getting to the Q&A session. And the discussion begins here. OK. So let me go through the questions here. All the multiple. Uh, okay, I'm not. I'm not sure I understand Spanish. So, could you please write a question in English? Because I just understand SQL from the question, but uh, the rest of the words are not really familiar to me. Sorry for that. Then, a question from Mr. Gomez: How does Starwind manage increasing storage requirements? Is storage limited to DAS? How do you scale out capacity? Does the increase? Okay, let me go one by one. How does Starwind manage increasing storage requirements? 
with Starwind, you can upgrade the local storage of your servers and add that storage to the Starwind virtual send pool and to your SQL server cluster appropriately. Then, next question, is storage limited to DAS? Storage is not limited to DAS. You can use your existing SAN devices or NAS, well, not not NAS. You, your existing SAN devices can be used. You can use your existing iSCSI SANs or fiber channel SANs and extend your local storage using these units. Starwind will then convert it into highly available storage for your SQL Server cluster. Then, how do you scale out capacity? With uh, this model we had here, the capacity can be scaled out using additional nodes. Let's say you have your two node SQL Server cluster, but you can technically add the third node, which has the third copy of the data. Starwind will manage that, even if you don't have a Windows Server failover cluster on that node, or if you just want to extend your SQL Server replication to one more server. So you can have another passive running on the third server. Then, uh, does the increase in performance offset performance issues with disk contentions? For example, separate physical logical disks. Uh, I'm not sure I have a solid answer on that question. Um, I would suggest I follow up with you on this question after the webinar. Then, what does FT stand for? FT stands for fault tolerance. So there is high availability where your application may, let's see, restart on the other host, and there is fault tolerance when the transition in a failover situation is seamless and you do not see it. So in case of Starwind, you do not see the failover process if one node fails. You just continue working and the only way to see if the server is failed and you're working from half a cluster, not the whole cluster any anymore, is to look at the server stats. So you're not really required to intervene in the cluster if something happens. Then, uh, hi, can this be achieved with Windows Server 2008 R2 and SQL Server 2012? Yes. the uh, Configuration I showed on this webinar can be achieved with earlier versions as well. So you just use FCI and point your Windows Server failover cluster to the local storage, which is converted to shared storage using Starwind Virtual SAN. Then, uh, are there any Starwind configurations that could replace log shipping to a DR side? Any features that would reduce database recovery times at the DR side? Let's see. Uh, Starwind features the off-site replication, so it is possible to sh replicate the entire disk the entire CSV to a DR site. Um, technically, if you include the off-site box to the DR, the, to the Windows Server failover cluster, I think that should be possible using multi-subnet clustering. You can have the database off-site available for instant launch. Yeah, I think that's possible. So you just read, you have your two servers doing the synchronous replication using Starwind Virtual Send, then have an asynchronous replica sitting on another node of Starwind ships the data to the asynchronous replica on its level. So it's not the log shipping made by the SQL Server cluster, it's Starwind asynchronous block level replication. And then you can use that asynchronous replica should the primary site fail. So this is possible. Then a uh, question from Gassan. What is the typical performance hit, if any, using this replication model? I would say that uh, worst case scenario, if you got 100% random write on your database all the time. In this case, you 
be limited to the performance of your local storage or to the performance of your synchronization network. So I would say that uh, if we write, we're limited to the performance of our local storage. If we read, our performance is actually doubled because we read from multiple instances at a time. Then uh, one more question. What is the maximum number of IOPS the storage? OK, what is the maximum number of IOPS? <coughs> Currently, we have uh, multiple configurations deployed using Stalvin and Virtual Send, and uh, the IOPS really vary. We have smaller configurations with one gigabit synchronization, which work at two, two and a half thousand IOPS. We have bigger configurations, which use multiple 40 gig Ethernet cables, and they deliver more than one million IOPS. I've seen both of these units in production. I've seen a lot of intermediate units where people use uh, mixtures of SAS storage and flash storage to get around 40 to 50,000 IOPS. And all that was doable was just uh, 10 gigabit direct connection between the servers. OK, one more question is uh, the minimum bandwidth link for Stalvin to operate. Minimum bandwidth link is 1 gigabit, and we support any network connection, gigabit or higher. Mostly, our customers are using 1 gigabit, 10 gigabit, and 40 gigabit these days. Some of our customers tried using 100 gigabit Ethernet, but I would say that's 1% of total so far. Then, uh, can Starwood operate in a hybrid mode? For example, use replicate DAS between two servers and access a SAN as a separate CSV unreplicated. Uh, I think yes, because uh, we can replicate DAS between two servers. That's the part which is handled by Starwind. And then we have our separate SAN and a separate CSV on that SAN. So it's actually a hybrid model to support for the SQL Server itself. So this configuration is supported. Then a question from Mr. Perez. If I only have two physical servers, how do I set up the cluster? I believe I need domain controller, DSN, DNS server, Starwin, SQL. Can this be installed in just two servers? What I need Hyper-V? Uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure if you can run Hyper-V and SQL as adjacent roles in the cluster, but uh, running Starwind and SQL within one server is supported. Running Starwind and Hyper-V within the same servers is also supported. So the only thing I would double check if it is possible to have a Hyper-V virtual machine running on the same host. One more question is, uh, backup or restore, is there any performance issue? Uh, as I mentioned, during the backups, you're reading the data of two drive sets simultaneously. So we should be able to shorten the backup window two times. And also, the performance penalty is less compared to just backing up local storage, which is replicated using native always-on capabilities. Uh, a question from Mr. Shakta. What's the price model for Starwind product? Starwind is licensed per terabyte. So we have a base license where we have two servers doing high availability and uh, provide one terabyte of highly available storage. And we scale from one two to four, eight, and uh, I think 16 and unlimited capacity. Then uh, <clears throat> we're also planning to change our licensing policy a little bit. And uh, you should be able to get more flexibility with Starwind. So this is the base licensing. and we're also developing additional programs. Okay, 
And one more question, a storage type, SSD or FC or SC. Uh, Starwin does support all types of storage, so you can use SATA, SAS, all types of SSDs, including PCI ESSDs, and all external block level storage is supported. So you can use DAS, like external disk shelf, you can use a fiber channel SAN, you can use an iSCSI SAN for Starwind. Okay, one more question from our attendees. Is replication free or it is licensed additionally? Replication is included in the base two node license. So you purchase the Starwind license, it is valid for two servers with uh, just storage capacity being limited. We do not charge for any other features. And uh, if you're interested in Starwind Virtual Send, feel free to contact our sales department. We've got the sales email on the screen right now. And our sales will gladly arrange you a live demonstration of the software. And the technicians who run the live demonstration will tell you how to use it, how to configure it, and what will be the best scenario in your particular case. Also, we are having a tap room meeting this Thursday and um, yeah and uh, if you're interested to learn more about Starvin virtual set I just dropped a registration link in the chat so feel free to register and look forward to seeing you on the tap room we have a relaxed atmosphere. We mostly do Starwind discussion, so we don't do a lot of talking on those events. So you can get down to all your technical questions and make sure you get the information about Starwind, which you wouldn't get on the web or maybe on this webinar. And with that, I think our questions is, no, one more question, sorry for that. Uh, Mr. Morales asks us, the throughput of a virtual SAN is the same as a real disk? Uh, yes, and moreover, it is actually better than a real disk because we add a layer of write-back caching provision from servers RAM on top, so you get better performance when using Starvin virtual send. If layer one RAM caching is not enough for you, you can also summon level two SSD caching and get more performance. And a final question for today. Are there any storage snapshots? Indeed, Starwind does support snapshots, so if you require this feature, you can have snapshots on site or you can also have snapshots taken to your off site location or to the third server. So let's say you have all flash configuration on your two primary servers and you have a third server with just SATA drives which will keep the snapshot history of your primary servers. So this is also supported if you're interested in doing this configuration with three servers where two are active and one just holds the snapshot, just drop an email to our sales and they'll provide you with more information about the solution. With that, I'd like to thank everyone for attending our today's event. I hope it was informative and interesting for you and look forward to seeing you on our other events. Have a good day. Bye-bye.